Our second speaker today is uh, Dr. Tobias uh, Barnica, who heads the Molecular Systems Group at the MRC London Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, Dr. Varnica did his PhD with Lawrence Hurst at the University of Bath in the UK and his postdoc with Fyodor Kondrashov and Ben Lena at the Center for Genomic Regulation in Spain. Uh, Dr. Varnica's team aims to understand how the workings of a cell influence natural variation within and between species. Their work so far has illuminated chromatin and chaperone biology in Archaea and E. coli, but his website suggests that he might soon turn his attention to octopods. So I hope we can look forward to some cool octopod work in the future, but for today we'll hear about archaeal histones. Thank you, Dr. Varnica, for presenting in our seminar today. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, let me just share my screen. Is that all good? Yeah, perfect. So, um, again, so thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm happy that uh, we, we can squeeze a bit of uh, evolution into the, into the chromatin mix. Um, and to start with, um, I think we should start with the star of the show which uh, clearly for everybody is their favorite complex, uh, the nucleosome. And I think the, the reason why the nucleosome holds a specific fascination for many of us is not necessarily because it grabs DNA, but um, because it acts as a platform, if you want, for the integration of, of information. And that, of course, is in part um, through post-translational modifications that can be flexibly added or removed. Um, but also through swapping histones out for paralogous variants. We just heard about Sembe, um, but there's many others um, in both higher and, and lower eukaryotes that um, can replace the core histones and both affect the biophysics of the nucleosome, if you want, in terms of leading to a different type of binding DNA, but perhaps more importantly, also alters the, the landscape of interaction partners. So, um, to take them together, and you might remember that if you had the pleasure of listening to, to Carolyn Luger's talk earlier in the series, um, together in sort of modular and dynamic form, you can, um, in a combinatorial fashion, if you want, encode quite a lot of complex information. Um, so sort of combinatorics of that are really sort of mind boggling, mind boggling if you think about how many paralogs and modifications and modification sites there are. To what extent these are actually used uh, in a sort of physiologically relevant context, it's a different question, but the, the theoretical space is very large. So what we're interested in, in in my group is is how these different layers of complexity really evolve. Um, and people have been been chiseling away at that question for a, a substantial amount of time, trying to understand, for example, how different uh, histone paralogs um, play different roles in expression and repair and during development and so forth. Um, one thing I want to highlight, though, is that despite all this dynamics, there's, you might, you might say, something that looks a bit like irreducible complexity um, in the nucleosome architecture itself. Because if you look at the, the optima, that's really quite invariant across eukaryotes as we know them. So if you look at yeast or frogs or humans, the structure of the nucleosomes, the nucleosome is really this octameric complex that wraps DNA. Um, and that's part of the reason why um, I've become really interested in uh, searching for answers outside the eukaryotes. And once you do that, you realize quite quickly that histones are present not only in eukaryotes, but also elsewhere. And that is um, bacteria. So there are some bacteria that have perfectly good looking histone fold proteins, and we know diddly squat about those. Um, but in bacteria, the distribution in phylogenetic terms is quite patchy. So what they actually do and whether they are so relevant is, is uh, not so sure. Uh, on the other hand, we have archaea, and histones um, are really quite common in archaea. So that's one reason to look at them. The other is, is phylogenetic, um, in that over the last less than 10 years, really, our appreciation of the relationship between eukaryotes and archaea and bacteria has, I would argue, permanently shifted. So you, all of you will be familiar with sort of classic three domain model proposed by Carl Woos, where you have bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, 
and archaea all share the same ancestor to the exclusions of eukaryotes and bacteria. And eukaryotes all share the same ancestor to the exclusion of, oops, sorry, of archaea and bacteria. So as new um, genomes have been sequenced, including of lineages that were previously unknown, that relationship has shifted, where now the eukaryotes very much look like just one special branch of archaea. So nestling within the archaeal diversity. So learning about archaeal histones, I think, can tell you something about the origins of uh, eukaryotic histones and the eukary eukaryotic nucleus. Um, I also want to highlight, though, that um, the sort of ancestry origins questions of the eukaryotic nucleosome is not the only reason to look at archaea. Because they're really common across archaea, um, you want to also ask questions about what else evolution has done um, with histones throughout different lineages of archaea. Okay, so what, what does this uh, archaeal histone actually look like? So from a, from a structural point of view, there are some things that are extremely similar looking when you compare it to what you know from eukaryotes. So that starts with the monomer, uh, where you have three arthropedises arranged in the, in the pattern you'll be familiar with, in the dimerization behavior, and then also in the formation of higher order tetramers. So that all looks very similar and comes with um, the preference for similar types of sequences. So um, sort of in a nutshell, more bendable, typically not very ATU-rich sequences. So from a sort of base structure point of view, very similar indeed. And I should highlight that the majority of stuff we know about uh, archaeal histones comes from the uh, lab of John Reef. Um, without whose work we would really be starting from nowhere. And then more recently elaborated specifically with the structure of the uh, archaeal histone complex from Caroline Lucas and some Thompson Angelo's part. So these are the similarities. Where are the differences? I think there are, there are really several fold that highlight what I think are the key ones. The first one, if you compare this archaeal histone from Methanothomus furbidus to Xenopus, is the absence of tails. So that's not an absolute thing. Some archaeal histones do have tails, both N and C terminal, but the vast majority of them uh, do not have them. So they're really just the core histone fold. Also, and related to the first point, um, nobody, as far as I'm aware, has found modifications in a sort of stoichiometrically meaningful uh, ratio. Um, third, there's no dedicated remodeling, also chaperoning machinery, as far as, as, as we are aware. They seem to be self-assembling just fine, both in vitro and also if we express them, say, in E. coli in vivo. Um, the second uh, big difference is that we're not stuck with the optima. So it turns out that archaeal histone diamonds can stack up in a sort of spiral-like manner to form a longer and potentially or theoretically infinite oligomer. Um, so let me, um, oops, sorry, so, move on. So um, fin final point I want to make in terms of the differences between archaeal and eukaryotic histones is that for those histones where people have looked, um, we know that different histones from the same species can both, both homo and heterodyne for us. So even though you lack tails, um, that means that, in principle, you might be able to generate quite complex chromatin states by using different histone paralogs expressed in the same cellular context, um, as I as sort of tried to illustrate um, here. So if you only have two um, histones in your genome and you're looking at a tetramer, then you can um, generate two to the power of four, so 16 different types of complexes. And if you then look at an archaeon that has more than two histones, for example, Methanospherus that money, which has seven, then you're looking at over 2,000 potentially different um, tetramer models. Okay. So that got us thinking uh, about whether Archaea might be able to use different paralogs to build sort of complex combinatorial chromatin states. And in the, in the question that's related, um, whether there are histone paralogs that have distinct functional roles within the organism. Um, 
So that's sort of the introduction. Before I move on to talk a little bit about what we've been doing here, um, I should highlight who's been doing the work. And that's been um, principally Katie, who's sort of halfway hidden behind Antoine here, who's been involved with the phylogenetic aspect of this. And then here at the back is, is Jake, who's our um, molecular dynamics specialist, if you want. And if uh, I make absolutely no sense and you'd rather uh, get some of the take homes in writing, um, we recently posted a, a preprint on BioArchive, um, so you can read more there if, you, if you're interested. Okay, so what have we done? Uh, as, you, as you might have gathered um, from, from the introduction, um, my background is computational. So although I think in the medium and longer term, um, in vivo and in vitro experiments will be absolutely critical to, um, to uh, pin down different paralogs, we started this from thinking about, can we use evolutionary analysis and maybe some molecular modeling to understand what histones in Archaea might be doing? So specifically, um, what we've done here is um, taken the structure from the Luger lab, stripped out one of the dimers, because it was a hexamer structure, um, and then um, modeled for a large range of Archaea all possible combinations um, of different histones within that same species and looked at, and then you can look at various things. We looked at two things in particular. One is um, what you might call tetramer stability. So the energy you find at the dimer-dimer interface. Um, and the second thing is DNA binding energy, which you can also sort of loosely think about as, as DNA affinity. How strongly does that tetramer bind to the DNA? Um, and really, we just wanted to start out exploring sort of the landscape, if you want, of potential diversity in histone DNA complexes. And to figure out how to advance this in a better way. There we go. Oh, there we go. Um, so I said we, we've done it um, for a large number of species. I really want to focus in on one group called the Methanobacterialis. Um, and there are several reasons. One is that it includes the organism we arguably most about, know most about, Methanothermus fervidus, which is down here with two histones. It also includes um, two archaea that we have a special interest in, and they're called Methanobrevibacter smithii and Methanosferus dadmani up here. They're both um, the only two really archaea that have been consistently found in human guts. So they're two, two gut, gut dwelling archaea. The, the other reason is that we seem to have sort of a cardinal number of histones here of three. So there's some sort of baseline diversity, and then this sort of expansion of para paralogous diversity along some lineages, especially in the Methanosphera, which has um, seven different histones, that's sort of type strain we normally look at. Um, good. So you do that, uh, and then you just pick out three different histones sorry, three different organisms, to look at the sort of distribution of diversity of tetramer complex properties. Sorry, it's a very long-winded. So if you look at Methanothermus fervidus, which has two histones, you get sort of 16 potential different complexes you can build with that. Um, and then you look at um, delta delta G in terms of DNA binding from a reference point, which is here the HMFB tetramer, and you look at dimer dimer interface energy. So you do that for Methanothermus fervidus and you find sort of a little cluster, some diversity. But once you get into species with more histones, that diversity gets quite a lot bigger. So along both dimensions, until you end up here with Methanosferus that money, where the space you can occupy, or you do occupy, at least in principle, is really quite large. So for people like me who sort of miss, uh, have no intuitive appreciation of what uh, different delta delta G values mean, 20 or even 40 is really quite large if you think about um, um, eukaryotic histones as a sort of counterpoint. So we have a large space that's also, at least in Methanosphere, quite densely populated by different complexes. So let's zoom in on that a little bit. And here I'm only looking at complexes where we have two different histones. So no complexes have three or four different histones. And I've colored them, or rather Katie colored them, um, by the histone that is dominant in that complex. So say the blue histone here called O383, um, very easy to remember, um, occupies the sort of upper right space. 
and other histones occupy more or less different areas of that graph. So that's interesting for, I think, for two reasons. And that shows you that if you were to express um, different histones in your cell, you would be moving to a different place. And it turns out that you probably would be doing that in a graded manner in many instances. So if you, um, in silico, alter the dosage of the histones in the complex, you can move sort of gradually through the space of DNA binding affinity in either direction, depending on the histone. To what extent that's actually used in vivo is sort of the key question, which we don't really know, but I think it's, it's interesting to highlight the potential. It's also interesting in that regard to highlight that well, when we look at expression explicitly, um, the histones are ordered in an interesting manner, which is that the histones that are most stable in terms of the tetramer are the ones that tend to be most highly expressed in exponential phase. Um, and then in stationary phase, you get um, you get changes that you would predict, at least based on the modeling, um, to give you changes in the chromatin state. So we've done these experiments uh, using an approach that you could describe as sort of fast scanning. So we use a force field and then just uh, look at the differences in energy that result from uh, changing into, uh, individual amino acids. Um, in a way, that's a little bit like taking a pair of trousers and then trying to put people with different body shapes into those and trying to understand what happens, whether the trousers are tighter or looser. What you really want to know is how the trousers affect different people. So are they really too tight? Can they not walk anymore? Do they have to hold the trousers up while running? Um, and the sort of simulation equivalent of that would be running molecular dynamic simulations. So um, that is what we did next for all of the homotetramers because the different histone homotetramers cover the space here really quite well. So what you see down here is the sort of length of the simulation, 100 nanoseconds. And then you notice that from the starting point, zero, zero, you sort of shoot up um, instantly. And you might think about that as the crystal structure relaxing. So you, you solvate the crystal structure and then what happens is, so that's normal, you, you see that, um, pretty much in all molecular dynamic simulations you do. And then you'd see for six histones that nothing much happens at all. Um, so why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because the seventh histone is much more interesting. So what you see here is that really it goes uh, somewhere off to the fairies. So here on the y-axis is the root mean square deviation from the first frame, so from the crystal structure starting point. And this one histone, 383, really behaves in quite a uh, different manner. So what does that look like? Um, I'm gonna show you one other histone on the left here that behaves normally if you want, and then this runaway histone 383. So I'm gonna start these simultaneously and you'll, you'll see what that actually translates like. Oh, let's just start this one as well. So on the left, you can see that nothing much happens at all, except the DNA, frayed DNA ends here moving about a bit. What happens on the right-hand side is much more interesting in that the tetramer really has, has come apart um, and will stay apart throughout the duration of the, of the simulation. Um, and really sort of incompatible with the typical um, tetramer arrangement that you would uh, expect in the crystal structure that I showed you um, previously. So what is, let's move on. Um, when you trace that back to specific amino acids, um, you'll not be surprised to learn that the amino acids that are involved are those that lie at the interface of those two dimers. Um, in particular, this patch here, where you have really quite highly conserved uh, consensus KHA in all the other histones, and then the um, 383 histone has a totally different uh, amino acid composition. And when we in silico mutate, especially this glutamic acid, back to a histidine, then you can see that it comes back down towards where the other histones are. Good. Um, so what, 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 are I, what, we are, what are we making of this? Um, and really, I think you should um, look at what I'm saying as a working hypothesis rather than the final word, because as I said, we are lacking very much the in vivo data here. But we think that the, the simulations are um, potentially um, consistent with what we call a capstone role. 
So imagine one of those oligomers that can extend and extend and extend and extend until you can extend no more. Um, if during that extension, you were to incorporate one of those capstones, um, you would then pre be prevented from extending any further. So we think they might, might act uh, as oligomer breakers, if you want. So that's sort of our, our working hypothesis. What's interesting is that we find this in Methanosphera, but it's not unique to Methanosphera. We see very similar behavior for archaea that are related, but not that, not that closely related to Methanosphera. So for example, uh, oops, let's go back. And there's one archaeon down here, the other gut archaeon, Methanobrevibacter smithii, you also have one outlier histone that really behaves quite differently. So is that just a sort of a coincidence to um, unique uh, independent innovations or are these actually evolutionary related? So if you want to answer that, you immediately think of starting to build phylogenetic trees, um, which is, is the right idea, but it's also when you think about archaeal histones, very annoying. And that a typical archaeal histones, because it has no tails, is very short, so 70 amino acids or so. Um, at the same time, it's quite highly conserved. So only a few positions at any one time will be varied. So this phylogenetic signal, if you want to get, is, is often really quite unstable. Um, having said that, as a sort of caveat, uh, let, me, let me show you what phylogeny is. So here is the phylogeny of all the histone genes in the Methanobacterialis. The first thing you'll notice is that at that key residue I highlighted earlier, most archaea, most histones in these archaea have a histidine. But then there's a cluster here at the right hand side, which includes Methanobrevibacter and Methanosphera, uh, where they have a very different residue. And those cluster together on, a, uh, on the phylogenetic tree. And that's at least at the face value consistent of that, uh, that type of histone, that lineage having um, uh, existed from the ancestor of Methanobrevibacter and Methanosphera, and then um, been maintained through these independent lineages over time. Um, back to what I said earlier, the support values, many of you will be familiar with bootstrap supports, are often not great. And that's um, just, a, just an issue with archaeal histones and short proteins in general um, that we have to deal with. So for this particular relationship, um, we, are, we are not 100% sure that that's really true. Um, for other paralogs in the same tree, we have a much better idea. And I'll walk you through, so to, through one case um, to, to help you, I think, understand um, why we think that. So here, again, it's the same tree. I've just collapsed some branches to allow you to focus on um, one group of archaea um, from the genus Methanobacteria. So these, this tree contains all the histone genes from different Methanobacteria genomes. Okay. One thing you will see, um, if you focus on one of these species, for example, one called SMA27, uh, which has eight different histone genes, is that sometimes they are clustered and sometimes they are spaced further apart. So this cluster down here, where histones from the same genome cluster, is really consistent with a recentish um, duplication event. So they're all more similar to each other than they are to histones from related species. These other three histones that are popping up individually are in fact the opposite. They are more closely related to histones from their sister species rather than to themselves. Um, and that suggests that um, this particular histone uh, existed at the, at the origin at the, in the ancestor of methanobacteria, or methanobacterium, I should say. Again, we're sort of hit with the fact that support values here are sometimes really quite low. Um, but we're nonetheless quite confident that this is the right relationship because we have another source of information we can look at, and that is synteny. So we look at where those histones are in these different genomes. And one thing that you can appreciate, if you take this cluster up here, for example, is that you find them again and again in exactly the same context. So this one I've labeled group one, then you have another histone down here, which is focused here, it's group two, and down here is something called group three. So finding the phylogeny being consistent with sort of ancientish origin of the paralogs 
and maintenance through time, but also the synteny, I think, um, is overall quite strong. And then you have other cases, you know, different lineages, where we see very similar patterns. So here I'm looking at um, one get genus called Methanobrevibacter, and again, you find this histone in different species of Methanobrevibacter popping up in the same syntenic context. And what I think is quite cool is that if you look at those trees side by side, you'll see that not only does the paralogous conservation um, go back to individual, uh, to the ancestor of Methanobacterium or Methanobrevibacter, but you find the same context here, group one, for example, or the group three, or group three, um, conserved in Methanobrevibacter and Methanobacterium, suggesting that the ancestor is, is um, at the, um, at, at, that the ancestor of Methanobrevibacter and Methanobacterium already had this arrangement of histones. And to give you a sort of a, a flavor for the timescales involved here, um, the last common ancestor of eukaryotes, uh, somewhere around 1.2 or 3 billion years ago. Um, this is sort of fiendishly difficult to evaluate for um, archaea because we lack fossil evidence. But people who have tried come up with an um, ancestor of Methanosphera and Methanobrevibacter, for example, at around 1.3 billion years. And the ancestor, last common ancestor of all the Methanobacteria is somewhere around 1.6 billion years. That's, that's got to be taken with a pinch of salt, but I think if we say several hundred million years of, the, of, of ancestry, uh, we're probably somewhere on the right track. Okay, so just to give you some take home messages if you want. Uh, one is that, that we think, like in eukaryotes, there is long term maintenance of distinct, recognizable paralogs that suggests that they are distinct physiological roles. Where really the, the gap in our knowledge is, is what these physiological roles are. So they're really in, in vivo and in vitro data as required. We have some initial evidence that some of the paradox are differentially expressed or have differential effects following deletion um, or have different DNA binding properties in vitro. But really we have to, we have to nail the, what the physiological roles of these distinct isoforms are. Um, the second take home is that how, how does it all relate to eukaryotes? Um, and I have to say it doesn't really. So I haven't shown you the relationship, but methanobacteria are up here and the lineage where eukaryotes are thought to emerge is here. So we're looking here at, at a parallel evolution, what evolution has done with histone, paral par uh, histone paralox independent of the emergence of, um, of eukaryotes. And I think that's, that's very important to keep in mind that we can use archaea not only to understand what happened in eukaryotes, but also how evolution has played with histones um, and done with histones in different uh, settings. And just to highlight that, drive that home one more time, we have a bunch of archaea where histones based on sort of label-free proteomics data are really quite common. So two, 3% of the proteome uh, are made up by histones. And that's consistent with something like a eukaryotic like one-to-one -one wrapping. But we have some archaea where histones are present but where the stoichiometry is not gonna be good. So if only 0.05% um, of the proteome are made up by histone or even less, I don't think that's um, uh, consistent with the role as a sort of histone as a global wrapping force. Um, so there's, there's a lot of diversity in the roles histones might play in different archaea that, that remains to be covered. And with that, I'm just gonna um, thank uh, all my people, all the people in the lab again, and people who have uh, helped us um, study these these critters, both experimentally and computationally. And thanks for listening. Thank you for that excellent talk. Uh, it was really clear, uh, and it is very nice to have someone from the evolution space uh, giving a project on the seminar as well. Um, so we have a question from Carolyn Luga. So I'm gonna allow you to talk so you can ask your question. Um, you should be able to I so oh, yeah go. sorry I had to I had to plug my microphone in. Nice talk Toby. This is Carolyn here. Um I, I, I was I was wondering uh about uh 
when you talk about the proteome, do you mean like the amount of histones present or the amount of histone, number of histone genes in these organisms? Because you could have just two, thing, two histones and have them heavily expressed. So what yeah. so, so, uh, Sorry, to, but that wasn't particularly clear. So you have some species like, you know, Thermococcus, Methanothermus furvidus, where you do only have two power logs, but they're quite highly expressed. So the last slide here, um, oops, can I go back? So here, what I mean is the fraction of peptides in a protein-wide scan that come from histones. And I'm pooling all the different power logs into one here. Does that make sense? Thank you for clarification. Okay, uh, we also have a few questions from some of the seminar organizers. So um, I'm gonna start with Christine. Do you wanna ask your question? Oh, okay, sure. Um, I had a bunch of questions, so let me just decide on which one um, to ask first. Um, okay, so actually, um, Ben and I were both wondering if um, these archaeal nucleosomes have an acidic patch. Um, short answer is no. Um, long answer is I. I can't rule out that some archaea in the data set will have something that looks like an acidic patch. So I, I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, not like, I'm not like intimately familiar with all the different histones, including those that have tails and don't have tails. Do you think it's because they don't have tails, I guess? Or I guess you just kind of mentioned it. So you, you have to think about those that do have tails. And I, I don't know whether those, some of those might have acidic patches. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's probably something that is a sort of eukaryotic elaboration. I, I can actually add to that. I was going to ask if I've stared at this <laughs> quite a bit. And yes. so um, <laughs> what we see when we do a charge surface representation of, of, our, of our structure and compare it to the eukaryotic nucleosome, it seems like it's less basic. Um, and it has, because it's symmetric, it has like these beautiful red splotches kind of decorating it. Uh, I don't think they're acidic patches, but they, they certainly have uh, some... Uh, non-uniform charge distribution. And I think there's a figure in our paper, in Francesca's paper, oh, that yeah. you could look, look up to that extent. Cool. Yeah, I have to revisit that because that's interesting if there's like a different binding hub or something on these. <laughs> yeah, but in a way, like, sorry, and I don't mean to take away from Toby, but you're kind of, if you <laughs> if you really are continuously wrapping or then you have less surface to, uh, yeah. to talk to, you know what I mean? So right. that's really in true the in the cell. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, we have a question in the Q&A from uh, Stephen Kravitz. Sorry if I butchered that. Uh, can you add to the structure of past a capstone? Can say it again? Can you add to the structure past a capstone? So, so that's, that's really what we are trying to propose that um, you shouldn't be able to add to the structure past the capstone. Um, certainly not with another capstone. Um, they seem to be sort of um, repulsive. Um, you might be able to come up with a um, local peptide conformation where you would be able to. Um, but yeah, we haven't... We've, we've explored a small space of potential um, histone combinations, I guess. So I can't rule it out. But the, the idea is that we shouldn't be able to, at least in the species where we looked at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So there is a question from Ben Martin. Ben, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. It's this fantastic talk. I was wondering, just on the, the following up on the capstone, um, histone variants. Do you think you'll find um, there's specificity in the deposition of these variants? So you hit like one of the key questions and we discussed that sort of briefly um, in the, in the preprint in that I think one of the key differences between eukaryotic and archaeal histones that I haven't mentioned is that you have local specification ability in eukaryotes. We have where you, where you can deposit Mm -hmm. um, modifications or paralogs in a locally specific manner, which then allows you to do a whole lot of things. 
we have no evidence to say that something like this exists in our care. So what we are thinking about at the moment is global changes in chromatin state. So where, for example, you transition from exponential to stationary phase, and you might, for whatever reason, have a more or less well-packed chromosome. Um, and that really is, a, the, the question is, does that evolve in, in eukaryotes? And that might, might well be the case. Um, and when, when does it evolve or has it evolved independently in our care? But we have nothing at the moment to suggest that we can locally deposit specific histone parallels. And so from a technical point of view, uh, histones in eukaryotes are great because they have a long floppy tail and you can, can tag all kinds of shit onto it, right? Archaea don't have that. So tagging is not so straightforward. Somebody should redo really it who knows more about uh, biochemistry than I do. Um, designing a linker that's compatible with unaltered binding behavior and then um, adding tags. But we don't know where these different histones, histone paradoxes go around the chromosome. And that's sort of really one of the key questions that needs answering. Thanks. Um, so I have a question, but before I ask mine, Carolyn Luga's hand is still raised. Uh, I wasn't sure if you, oh, okay, it went down. <laughs> um, I was wondering, so in your initial tree, you had uh, some archaea that had lots of different copies. Uh, and I'm wondering if you think that they're all sort of copies of the same histone, so there's just lots of copies of it, or if they have different specialized functions. And is that something you've looked at? So um, we, have, we have both cases. So some are clearly recent duplications um, that might come and go in a sort of accordion-like fashion, and we just might hit a stage in the evolution of the organism where we see a few more and a few less. Some are really quite distinct in sequence, and they are probably down to horizontal gene transfers, especially in Methanosphera, where we rarely see tandem arrangements, um, but histones dotted throughout in different syntenic contexts that are quite sequence distinct. So we, we presume they probably come in from somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I think it's an all sorts. So you, you'll, see, you'll see recent duplications, you'll see past sequence divergence. But what what of all of these are doing is a, it's a different question altogether, I think. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I want to encourage the audience to ask more questions so it's not just the panelists that are asking questions. Um, but while we wait for them, I'm wondering if you, I think this is something you might have tried, uh, but I apologize if I don't know the literature well enough. Um, have you expressed some of these in E. coli or yeast and done vice versa? Like, can you express eukaryotic histones in RK, I'm not sure how tractable they are. Um, so we, we have expressed archaeal histones in E. coli, so that works fine with um, uh, sort of a thermostable histone like the one from Methanothermus fervidus. It doesn't work quite so well with histones that are adapted to sort of body temperature. Um, we are uh, in the process of trying expressing eukaryotic histones in bacteria as well, but we need to come up with some tricks to make that work. Um, I'm not aware of anyone having tried expressing eukaryotic proteins in um, archaea, um, which is sort of trickier and less accessible to many people because um, many of the few species that are um, genetically accessible are annoying in other ways, right? Uh, high temperature, pressure, uh, sulfuric acid flying through the air. Um, so I'm not, I'm not aware. Um, and I, I think you, you need quite a lot of trickery to make that work from, you know, you have to replace the chaperones, maybe you have to make sure everything folds correctly, doesn't um, interact with stuff it shouldn't be interacting with. So I think it might work, but you might have to invest quite a lot of time in making it work. Um, okay, we have a question from Pallabi. So you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, amazing talk, actually. I don't know, it could be sounding a very philosophical question, but I was wondering that uh, the whole, uh, since it does, archaeal histones does not undergo modifications, then uh, how is it bypassing the whole need of requiring uh, of maybe the function that we have in eukaryotes of histone readers uh, or 
specifications that are mediated by epigenetic is it that the uh, changes between the uh, like the nucleosomal structure the energy difference or the biophysical difference itself is uh, uh, quite readable for the or it, that is what is being sensed by archaea to undergo changes or what is it so we short answer is we don't know um, and that also sort of touches on the questions of what maybe the the original function of histones is. If it's just it's just wrapping and and wrapping uh, with different tightness, if you want to sort of put it loosely, then I think different power locks can um, do that on a global scale. Um, but it, sort of coming back to to one of your points about what what was reading those differences, we don't know if there's we don't know if there's any reading. It might just be global modulation in how accessible um, certain uh, chromatin is uh, in certain stages of the life cycle and under different conditions. Um, but we, we don't know any specific readers, for example. People have proposed that um, um, histones um, and maybe different power loads might be controlling different processes. But much of that research, I think, is seen through a very eukaryotic lens. So we, we're all obsessed with nucleosomes and their role in gene expression, for example, right? We have, yeah, no, yeah. it's not actually that, we know that histones affect what, how the polymerase progresses from in vitro work. We know that stuff happens when you delete one histone, mm -hmm. gene expression changes, but gene expression changes if you delete anything. So whether there's any, there's any direct physiological role for histones in regulating gene expression, for example, I don't think it's, it's that clear. Oh, that actually, uh, I, that brings me to another question. So does archaeal histones also, like the nucleosome that it forms, like eviction, so does it uh, have the, that kind of uh, processes of nucleosome eviction and those kind of things happen in archaea? I'm, I'm not very sure, so I'm just asking. So again, our, our sort of knowledge is limited um, to the histones people have looked at. Um, but there's evidence that at the right stoichiometry, if stoichiometry is high enough, you inhibit both initiation and elongation. But I think um, in most cases, um, you have a situation where the polymerase as a sort of super strong motor is, is probably powerful enough to kick these structures off. So they're not typically as robust to, um, to interference as maybe the eukaryotic nucleosome is. So that's sort of my, my speculation. So we, but we, we know very little about what exactly happens in, in vivo. It's also in vitro work base. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll take one last question because I think this is a question many people might have. Uh, this is from Mariela Cortez Lopez. Have you checked if there are any archaeal histones that have a similar reductase function to the recently described H3H4 in yeast? Um, so um, I met Siavash, uh, I guess, two years ago. And at the time, we looked at uh, an alignment of uh, archaeal histone genes we had, I had there at the conference. And we didn't see the same residues that he thinks are um, required for that function. If I remember right, it's like a histidine and the, the um, cytidine in a certain arrangement, right? Uh, a, a cysteine in, in a certain arrangement. So, um, we have no direct evidence, but I think we, it's probably worth looking again and looking more deeply at. Okay. Uh, well, with that, we will uh, see you in the speaker chat in five, five to ten minutes. But thank you very much. That was an excellent seminar. And thank you, Natalia, as well.